Good afternoon, all. My name is uh, Corinne Lennox. I'm a senior lecturer in human rights at the School of Advanced Study at the University of London and co-director of the Human Rights Consortium. I'm one of the co-hosts for this global conference we've been hosting all week on human rights and foreign policy. And this is our fourth and, and final uh, plenary and public session where we'll be looking at um, NGO perspectives on human rights advocacy and foreign policy. Uh, as conference organizers, we were very keen to ensure that, um, that we also open up the discussion to practitioners of human rights. And so all of our plenaries have featured practitioners uh, as well. Uh, and the, it, so that they may discuss the challenges that they face in using diplomacy for human rights aims. Uh, NGOs, of course, are often at the forefront of persuading states to become allies in their advocacy. And major theories of international relations have looked closely at the role of non-state actors uh, like NGOs and show the key role that they play as, as what we call norm entrepreneurs. And also in linking people who have experienced human rights violations um, to uh, international allies, often through information sharing on human rights violations. Uh, and NGOs are just uh, one type of civil society actor. Uh, they also work with other actors such as social movements, trade unions, the, and the media, etc. Uh, and they also have their own strengths and, and weaknesses in these processes. So today I'm very pleased that we have a chance to hear directly from senior leaders in global human rights in the global human rights movement and how they engage in international advocacy and how they make use of different allies, particularly state allies, uh, to seek human rights compliance by states. So first, let me introduce uh, two of our panelists that have joined us uh, so far. First, we have uh, Ahmed Adam, who works as the UN Advocacy Program Man Manager for the Asian Forum for Human Rights and Development, also known as Forum Asia. He's based in Geneva. Uh, he's worked for Forum Asia since 2013 in different capacities related to research and advocacy. Prior to joining Forum Asia, he had worked uh, for the government of the Maldives. Forum Asia is a Bangkok-based regional network of 81 member organizations across 21 Asian countries with UN consultative status and a consultative relationship with the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. It was founded in 1991 and works to strengthen movements for human rights and sustainable development through research, advocacy, capacity development, and solidarity actions in Asia and beyond. And it has sub-regional offices in Geneva, Jakarta, and Kathmandu. Also joining us is Mark Lyman, who's Executive Director of the Universal Rights Group, a think tank focused on international human rights policy with offices in Geneva, where Mark is based, in New York and Bogota. Prior to founding the Universal Rights Group in 2013, he worked as a diplomat at the UN Human Rights Council from 2006 to 2012. Uh, he had many roles in that capacity, amongst them being lead negotiator in nine different human rights resolutions, dealing with issues such as human rights and climate change, human rights and the environment, freedom of assembly and association, and the, uh, the third optional protocol to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in addition to preparing reports and presentations to UN treaty bodies, to special procedures, and also the Universal Periodic Review. Outside of the Human Rights Council, he's also negotiated agreements and resolutions in the context of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, at ECOSOC and the WTO, amongst others. And he's written extensively on the human rights system, both in journals and books on topics such as the special procedures and freedom of religion or belief. And you can find more details on that on the Universal Rights Group website. I have to give apologies to our one of our speakers, Dr. Sanjoy Hazarika, director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, who's not been able to join us due to pressures that he has to attend to today. And I'm hopeful that our fourth speaker, Juan Equetel, who's the director of Connect Us, uh, will be joining us shortly. We've reached out to her to make sure that she can access our meeting. So to get started, the format I wanted to have today was more of a roundtable discussion. And I was going to start us off by posing three different questions to our panel members and give them a chance to respond. And then we'll open up questions to the audience. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q and A button. And there you can uh, write down questions to our, our panel members and we'll do our best to address as many as we can in the time that we've got. 
So to start us off, our first question concerns changes to traditional state allies on human rights issues. Now, depending on the human rights issue area, the traditional ally may be different. So for example, I work on minority and indigenous rights. Traditional allies have been the likes of Hungary on minority rights, Mexico on indigenous rights. Um, but there has been an increasing authoritarian or populist turn in many, uh, in many democratic states, which might also impact on their support for international human rights. So the first question I have for our panelists are your state supporters, let's say from five years ago or even three years ago, still reliable allies on human rights issues? Or have you had to adjust those allies and possibly also your strategies? Uh, so perhaps I can start with, with Ahmed if you wanted to open with some comments on, in, in that question. Thank you. Thank you, Karin, uh, first for inviting us to be part of this panel, um, this very interesting discussion. Um, just to jump right into the question, I think uh, Forum Asia's main advocacy objectives at the Human Rights Council has been very much uh, country focused. Uh, we have uh, been heavily involved in country specific resolutions of the Council, especially on, on Asian situations. Um, the states from the Global South have traditionally been opposed to country specific action at the Council. So our allies have um, largely remained the same and they've mostly been uh, Western states. Although there has been uh, uh, changes in the, in the makeup of some of these groups, uh, especially for example, in the case of Sri Lanka, the resolution on Sri Lanka was um, until the US pulled out, uh, was led by the US, until the US pulled out of the Human Rights Council was led by the US. But after the US pulled out, uh, a different set of uh, states took over as core group, which also consisted of, interestingly, smaller states like North Macedonia and Montenegro. And, and uh, this year, in, in March this year, Malawi joined as a, co uh, as a member of the core group, which uh, sort of gave a, a, a broader, uh, the resolution more a sense of uh, a cross-regional initiative. Um, in 2019, again, we've seen a, a resolution led by Iceland uh, on the situation of human rights in the Philippines after years of advocacy and after uh, many larger states uh, failed to take up the issue uh, of the Philippines at the Human Rights Council um, in response to the extrajudicial killings um, in, the, in the context of the so-called war on drugs that the current president uh, uh, launched when he was elected to office. Um, especially also in a, with our significant focus on Myanmar, ASEAN has become an important stakeholder. I wouldn't say an ally, but an important stakeholder in advocacy. Uh, they, they do have a lot of, um, they do play a strong uh, role in the negotiations among states on, on, the, on the resolution. Uh, same uh, on the issue of Myanmar, OIC has also become more of an important ally, uh, I would say, uh, when it comes to advocacy on Myanmar. OIC has traditionally opposed country-specific uh, issues at the Council, other than those related to Palestine and Israel. Um, but uh, I think the cooperation between OIC and the EU was instrumental in, in the creation of a standing accountability mechanism on Myanmar in 2018, which now functions as the independent international uh, investigative mechanism for Myanmar, which uh, is mandated to collect and preserve and prepare case files for future prosecutions. But I, I think I also want to highlight that not all states that we identify as allies are always allies. Quite often, I think uh, their failure to take action consistently on situations across the board uh, sometimes becomes counterproductive to our advocacy as well. For example, the failure of EU uh, and, and, and other Western governments uh, to support the recent resolution of the Council on the uh, to establish an independent commission of inquiry to investigate violations uh, in the occupied Palestinian territory following the recent um, escalation of violence. I think that, uh, that dealt a significant blow to their legitimacy to pursue accountability elsewhere. So I think uh, the, the allies uh, it tend to shift as, as you have mentioned at the beginning, uh, depending on the, uh, on the issue. And then I think uh, one of the most important issues, uh, one of the most important challenges that we have is the lack of consistency of these different allies in, in how they approach different issues. I think I'll stop there for now and yeah. 
Thank you. That, that's very interesting and important to point out that, um, yeah, a state is not singularly reliable across the board on, on issues and will have its own foreign policy interests that might interfere with that. Um, Mark, what's your take on this question? Well, thank you for the invitation and very good question um, to start with. I mean, I've been at the Human Rights Council uh, as a diplomat and a a think tanker uh, since 2006. So I've had uh, time to to watch uh, the changes. And I would, in my opinion, um, alliances, uh, friends, foes, uh, which of course shift depending on the issue. Uh, Ahmed mentioned country specific that it's traditionally just been the West uh, that's worked on um, addressing situations of, of of violations in a geographic context, although over the, the recent years, a big change has been the uh, Latin Americans have started to become much more active in that area, in particular focused on countries in their own backyard, um, Venezuela being the obvious example. Um, so there have been shifts uh, depending on the issue, but most of the time alliances have remained fairly steady. Um, why is that? Well, often, and people often don't realize it, they think that a mission in Geneva is a perfect reflection of government policy back home, uh, but often they're not. Often people in the foreign ministry are far more progressive and liberal uh, than their uh, politician, political masters back home. And so you see um, that the same missions continue to try, obviously sometimes a bit more quietly than they used to, but they continue to try to do the right thing uh, in Geneva. You mentioned Hungary as a good example. Um, you know, we all know what Orban is like um, and his views on a robust civil society. Yet uh, in Geneva, Hungary continues to work on uh, resolutions relevant to civil society, whether it's a civil society space or reprisals, um, although they try to do so a little bit under the radar. Um, Brazil, another good example, pretty awful uh, president, of course, for the past few years. And yet the Brazilian mission has really tried to remain fairly progressive and fairly constructive. Uh, the UK, another example, uh, you know, pretty awful behavior over the past few years when it comes to respect for rule of law, um, when it comes to, you know, the massive cuts in the aid budget at the moment, um, when it comes to, you know, pretty rampant corruption these days in the context of, of COVID and um, uh, government response, including uh, PPE procurement. Um, and yet the, the mission here in Geneva continues to be a very positive, a, a big force for good uh, and try to kind of smooth the edges of some of the uh, instructions and some of the crazy messaging that's coming out of London. Um, just two quick short points. Um, the, where there have been shifts actually, and I'm not only talking about ally, allies here, just generally, um, it's tended, in my opinion, it's tended to be actually shifts for the better. Um, and a good example of that is the West, uh, which traditionally has been very, you know, uh, ambivalent when it comes to economic and social rights, for example. Uh, and if anybody mentioned the right to development, they would often explode in a, a shower of, of sparks because they really didn't like that. Uh, but we've seen over the past 15 years a big change there. The Western group, um, especially the European Union, have started to take a much more positive view on economic and social rights. The pioneers there were Germany and Spain, who led the resolutions on the right to water and sanitation. Um, so, uh, and, and that's the case across the board, uh, I think. Um, some countries, you know, Denmark, as was mentioned to me in an email, uh, uh, may be a little bit more reticent, but generally they have been much more positive towards uh, economic and social rights, and at least are now willing to talk about the right to development. Another good example is freedom of expression. Um, 10 years ago, uh, Denmark, the United States, the Netherlands, Sweden, 
were real freedom of expression extremists, in my view. Uh, you have to, if you remember back to the Mohammed cartoons um, back in the day, uh, the reaction of the West was essentially, look, this is not up for negotiation. Freedom of expression is absolute. And there's no way we're going to do anything to control offensive caricatures or, or videos attacking or inciting hatred against Muslims like the Innocence of Muslims video in the Netherlands. Um, that's changed massively. Um, the, the West is now much more willing to talk to the OIC um, about you know, what are the limits of legitimate free expression? Uh, where does it fall? Where does it overlap with hate speech? Um, what is the limit of uh, hate speech and free speech? Um, and, you know, that's changed the, one only needs to look at the recent news about Facebook and Twitter uh, blocking now disinformation or fake news, blocking hate speech. Um, supported by Western governments, including the EU, and amazingly, increasingly, the United States. So a big change there. And lastly, on China, because I think it's not obviously a traditional ally of human rights advocates, but we've seen, in my opinion, we've seen a reverse situation there. Um, for a long time at the Human Rights Council, China was pretty invisible. They were only there to monitor any criticism of their behavior, for example, with Tiananmen Square. Um, then about seven, eight years ago, they obviously decided to try and play a more progressive and positive role, uh, bringing for the first time initiatives to the Human Rights Council, trying to engage, for example, with the Universal Rights Group on events. Um, it was, of course, things like the right to development, but it was still a positive shift. Then, unfortunately, in my view, um, Human Rights Watch um, about five years ago, persuaded the US government to, uh, during this kind of warming period, to issue a, a fairly stinging joint statement at the Human Rights Council criticizing China. And then within a week, all of these kind of more positive diplomats uh, in Geneva were all recalled to Beijing and replaced by hardliners. And that was really the beginning of this so-called wolf warrior diplomacy on behalf of China. It wasn't only that, but it was around that time. And now they're a very aggressive um, uh, actor and very effective actor in Geneva. But I'll stop there. Thanks, uh, Mark. That last comment and some of the earlier things you said really highlighted um, sort of a dilemma for researchers of foreign policy, which is how do you <laughs> disaggregate the state actors? You know, it's not necessarily a unitary force. You said that's more progressive amongst the missions than, than capitals. And how do we understand the dynamics and, and where is the progressive voice in, in the state as a whole? Um, because you've, you've ended with China, that's a nice transition into our, the second question I have, which is, the so-called rising or emerging powers, although some of these are <laughs> powers in themselves without having had need to re-emerge. Uh, we have the BRICS, so countries like Brazil, Russia, uh, India, and China, South Africa, uh, and the so-called MINTS, um, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, uh, Turkey. Um, of course, many of these states have a long history of, in of engagement already with the UN norm making from day one, norm making on human rights. Um, but what do you see in the contemporary period? What role do these powers play in, in driving or in constraining human rights uh, standards internationally? Um, do you see similarities and differences between the positions of these, these sort of rising uh, powers and and if you could give a few more examples, you've, we've already heard a bit, but some of where you've worked with these states in your advocacy, have they proven to be allies in some issues? So it'd be great if you could elaborate on those points. Um, let's go back to you again, Ahmed, if you'd like to start, please. Thank you. I, I think we'll probably start with China as well. Uh, China has become increasingly active at the council. Um, uh, and they've started to, um, lead initiatives, uh, resolutions, uh, I think, which is quite a new trend uh, past a few years. Um, and I think it has also had, uh, uh, could have potential long-term impacts on, on things. Um, 
for example, China is leading a resolution on, on mutually beneficial cooperation, uh, which they call or is also described as win-win resolution, which um, could uh, potentially be detrimental to the consensus on universality, inter interdependence and interconnectedness of all human rights as articulated in Vienna Declaration, for example. Um, it tends to prioritize development and poverty eradication at the expense of other human rights or international scrutiny of human rights situations in countries and tends to project international cooperation as an end in itself rather than a means to an end which could be protection and promotion of human rights uh, around the world. Um, I think on the positive side, um, Indonesia has been one of the uh, core group members of, of the mandate on the sp uh, special proceed special rapporteur on the freedom of uh, peaceful assembly and of association. And Indonesia is op quite open to engagement with civil society, not always receptive to the ideas, but I think it's a it's a good um, a, a good sign that they're they're at least open to engagement with civil society. I think Indonesia has was one of the first countries to start uh, regular uh, consultations with um, with civil society before and after sessions in Geneva as one of the first Asian governments to do that. Although they have kind of, uh, I think again, with the change in the mission itself, they've sort of changed the policy now, they don't do that. Although I think before the pandemic, again, they tried to reach out to civil society, but then, uh, I think when everyone was still trying to find out how to meet in the middle of the pandemic, it sort of uh, felt that it didn't really uh, go through. Um, I think uh, other other countries like the Philippines and Vietnam has been strong on the issue of climate change and environment. Um, again, not always might not always be a positive thing. Philippines leading on climate change while. The, the country has one of the highest number of killings of human rights environmental defenders who, or, and uh, human rights defenders who work on environment. So I think it in some ways uh, make it difficult for some of us, uh, especially those of us working in, in the Philippines or monitoring and covering Philippines on other issues to take them seriously. Uh, but I think it's a good sign that they are willing to engage on issues like climate change. Um, same as Vietnam. Vietnam is probably one of the darkest spots for human rights. Um, does not get a lot of um, attention at the international level for the, for the for the human rights situation inside the country. Uh, again, perhaps because uh, there's really no independent civil society space and then there's no space for independent advocates to be active. Uh, but on, on one hand, that is the situation. They're also leading international efforts to promote certain issues. Um, could be, again, a, a potential opening for engagement with them. Um, um, I, I think India uh, is one of the largest countries, has been, has been quite uh, negative, I think, when it comes to a lot of issues, especially civil, civil and political rights issues. Um, has been quite negative, uh, has been leading some of the uh, some very negative uh, proposals, for example, on civil society space resolutions, um, which uh, tend to mirror their own restrictions at the national level, for example, on uh, receiving foreign funding, things like that. Um, and, and I think finally, there's also increasing pressure on on existing institutions and mechanisms, for example, the special procedure mandates uh, from certain governments like uh, China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, that these countries that have uh, been probably on the receiving end of scrutiny by independent uh, special procedure mandate holders, they have been uh, uh, leading initiatives. Nothing has concretized that at the moment, but I think there's also a lot of negotiations going on at the moment on that. But there are always um, rumors of resolutions to further um, sort of cut the wings of the special procedure mandates, for example, to, to limit their role and the independence and then their effectiveness. And can I just uh, press you to elaborate a little bit on that last point? So what, what, are, what, will be, what is rumored to be some of the proposals that would restrict special procedures? I think there's a, there's a, a uh, initiatives that could uh, further expand the the rules of rules and procedures of, of their conduct, or the 
the, and, and limitations on the mandates and, and the independence of mandate holders. Uh, they tend to be um, quite independent and quite, I think one of the biggest allies that civil society has when it comes to advocacy at the Human Rights Council are uh, special procedure mandate holders. They, uh, they, they, don't, they do not have uh, limitations on which NGOs or who they can engage. Uh, they're not constrained by the ECOSOC of uh, accreditation and, and things like that. So I think further uh, limitations on their their mandates and and uh, restrictions on rules and, and the rules of procedures and things like that could have significant impact on how they could continue engagement with special procedures or independently monitor situations that require scrutiny. Thanks for elaborating on that point, because it's an, a good reminder that the mechanisms that we have are not as secure as we would <laughs> like to think, right? They're not permanent uh, entities within the UN. They can be changed by, by political agreement, at least certainly the special procedures. Uh, Mark, what's your, what's your view on these uh, yeah, so-called emerging or rising powers? How are they coming into your work now? Yeah, thanks. I mean, just on that last point on special procedures, you're right, they're not as secure as we think, but they're also not as perfect <laughs> as we think. And, you know, we should always be careful about the efforts by Russia or others to, to circ circumscribe the independence of special procedures, for example, but we should not be blind to the fact that there are significant problems in the special procedure system. And some of them behave appallingly uh, very regularly, completely breaking uh, the code of conduct and their mandate in their behavior. So, you know, there is, there are two sides to that coin. But anyway, that's uh, the potential topic of a full day conference just on its own. Um, in terms of BRICS, I mean, I already mentioned uh, China. Um, so I won't go over that again. But I would say that it's interesting. It raises interesting questions for human rights advocates. Um, and that is, uh, because what happened, as I said, is China was trying to, you know, come in from the cold a little bit. And you could argue whether that was a PR exercise or otherwise, uh, but they were making a big effort and they really were, I met many delegations uh, who came over from China and they were genuine in their wish to try and put a more positive face <laughs> anyway at the UN. Um, and that was destroyed basically because of a civil society action. Um, Western civil society action, as I said, encouraging the US and others to do uh, very aggressive joint statements. Um, and I don't want to get into the rights and wrongs of that, but it does raise, an imp and, and it continues to this day, whenever China comes out with an initiative, for example, on mutually beneficial cooperation or, you know, whatever they do, whatever they do, um, Often I have the impression that the knee-jerk reaction of Western human rights advocates and Western governments is just to oppose it because it's China. And I always say to them, have you actually read the resolution? Uh, the, there's very little in there that's worrisome, um, but you know they feel as though they have to oppose it because it's China. And I wonder whether that whether it's best to keep China on the outside or to bring them more fully into the international human rights protection system, even though maybe it's a bit too late for that now because they've, I think, pitched their tent. Uh, Russia, extremely influential, of course, but um, Russia is interesting. They seem to lose interest a bit when the US is disengaged. Uh, so now uh, under Trump, the Russia went a little bit more quiet than normal, but now under Biden, uh, I expect to see them back all guns blazing. Um, India and South Africa, it's good. I'm glad that you asked about these BRICs. For me, these are the two of the most disappointing uh, countries at the Human Rights Council over 15 years. Um, both, of course, have got wonderful human rights stories to tell. Uh, uh, India, the biggest democracy in the world. Uh, well, um, yeah, the biggest democracy in the world. South Africa, of course, and um, post-apartheid South Africa. And yet they're, they vacillate between uh, being completely apathetic and you know silent most of the times and then except when you know there's a, a, a good opportunity to bash the west and then they suddenly start uh, talking but the the difference i always think between the country or the delegation they could be uh, 
at the UN and the delegation they are is about as wide as you can possibly imagine uh, for a state. Uh, Brazil, I already mentioned. A few of the other countries that are influential, um, Mexico, Morocco, uh, these kind of countries are interesting because the, they have a very clever strategy and that's to be um, have very good delegations in Geneva and be very proactive and positive and constructive and being involved in lots of initiatives. And I'm sure they do that for good reasons, but one of the strategies behind that is because by being incredibly useful and, uh, and positive, it reduces the risk that they will be criticized at the Human Rights Council. And a lot of people don't realize that, and I'm friends with delegates from these places, but it's a very clever strategy, and it's what China was trying to do a few years ago, uh, I think. Um, Philippines, Bangladesh was mentioned by Ahmed, for example, initiatives on human rights and climate change. That's another example of that, where countries with, you know, have, with things to hide tend to latch on to initiatives so that they can, in a sense, go on the offensive. Uh, I've never really been convinced that Philippines and Bangladesh in Geneva really want to use the UN human rights system uh, in a meaningful way to address climate change. They more see it as a potential stick that they can use to hit the West over the head with because the West is always criticizing them. So um, yeah, and I'll stop there. Yeah, certainly there's a long history of um, using the West's failures in, in human rights diplomacy as a way to score to score points. Uh, so it's interesting that you see that both of you see that happening to some extent in the, the climate change and environment discussions. Um, the final question that I have is in concerning the context in which human rights NGOs are operating now. And uh, we see shrinking space for human rights defenders in many countries. Um, Ahmed has mentioned the persecution of environmental human rights defenders. That certainly is a huge portion of those who are, are targeted currently. Um, there are also reports of reprisals for human rights defenders that would go to Geneva, for example, to make statements and face reprisals uh, for that on the way home or for their families, etc. So how do these constraints impact on your international advocacy work? And are NGOs using new strategy for advocacy with states or with multilateral institutions as civil society is, is facing these kind of serious pressures. So Ahmed, you have, you're a member organization. Perhaps you could, you could comment as well how your members are, are dealing with these challenges. Yeah, I, I think uh, all, Every, every single country that we, we work in with, with members. We have, we work in about uh, 21 countries where we have members. Uh, there's, a, there's a trend of shrinking civil society space in pretty much all of these countries. Um, and uh, I think it, uh, it makes the, for example, I think you've mentioned in the, in the question also the, the role of uh, local embassies. It, it highlights the role of local embassies. Many Western governments have protection of human rights defenders as a foreign policy objective in their, in their foreign policy documents. So what we have tried to do is, especially in cases where individual human rights defenders face reprisals or imminent threats, that reaching out to uh, such uh, uh, embassies of, of, of those countries uh, to see if there is any way that they, they can, uh, what they can do to, to protect uh, those individual defenders who are facing risks. But quite often, I think there is a there's a quite it, it is quite challenging to get them first involved in cases like that because there's a, there's there seems to be a huge disconnect between what's written in foreign policy documents in the capital and the mandates given to the local embassies. Um, so it, many local embassies, uh, especially in our region, uh, tend to prioritize trade and economic relations over human rights. Um, uh, I think UK is uh, one of the uh, leading countries in the uh, Freedom of Expression Coalition um, uh, as part of the foreign policy objective together with uh, Canada and, and some others. Um, we have, uh, for example, tried to get them uh, to, to work in Thailand um, as part of this initiative on um, uh, to, to push for reform of their uh, less majestic legislation. 
the legislation that criminalizes uh, criticism of the monarchy, which uh, is one of the harshest in the world, I think. Uh, criticism, um, even um, comments that could remotely be seen as criticism of the monarchy could land individuals in, in prison for up to 15 years. Um, but it doesn't seem to be a priority for the mission of the embassy in Bangkok. Um, so it, the, the, that huge disconnect, I think, uh, uh, plays also a significant role in, in, in perhaps uh, failing the foreign policy, especially the human rights objectives of uh, many Western governments uh, and, and undermining the impact of, uh, of what they try to do through uh, grants and, and, and support to local uh, civil society organizations. Um, but I think also, there's been positives. UPR, for example, has opened up uh, important opportunities for engagement with local embassies. I think that's uh, that's one place where local embassies uh, have played a significant role. Um, when it comes to UPR uh, advocacy, um, local embassies tend to be the first point of contact for local civil society organizations. Um, so uh, again, not that it really translates into anything concrete uh, on the ground or in action, but it's, it, it gives a lot of um, openings for local activists to start engaging uh, with international actors on human rights, because uh, UPR tend to be non-controversial and, and cooperative. The states are more willing to engage even at local level on issues around UPR. But I think also the pandemic has opened up several opportunities for civil society, especially those from the from the global south to engage, especially with the Human Rights Council and the diplomats in Geneva. It's usually quite expensive for uh, defenders to fly to Geneva and to, to advocate for their issues. But uh, now with the new working modalities, uh, the diplomats are more willing to engage with uh, activists and human rights defenders on the ground uh, online. Um, impact of that again, I, I mean, I don't know, at, at least it gives the local defenders a sense that they're they are able to speak to diplomats based in Geneva. It's not always clear whether they're actually listening. Uh, they usually have the, the videos turned off and then it looks there online, but uh, uh, it's, we're not sure if, um, if, if they're actually listening. So th there are two sides to that. Uh, there are some diplomats who are quite uh, good and, and are very open to interactive engagement with uh, defenders on the ground um, uh, through online platforms as well. Um, but then also, I think when we talk about this remote engagement with diplomats and the Human Rights Council, we should also be careful not to make this as an excuse for the council to further restrict the space for civil society. Uh, not to make it normalized um, after the pandemic, that the, the, to make it the only way that civil society can engage with the council, that, that would be quite detrimental to the advocacy of NGOs at the council. So yeah, there, there are two sides to that as well. Yeah. Let's stop there. That, that's a very interesting point about the pandemic and certainly even for our own conference, the way we've done it online has increased uh, access for lots of people. Um, but you're right, we, what we don't want is that then people can't go to Geneva, you know, are barred by various stringent regimes and can't have those side meetings, which are very important also to diplomacy as well. Um, Mark, what's, what's your take on this point? I know you're a different type of organization, a think tank. Is this something in terms of work that you've been doing, um, civil society strategies and access in light mm. of these difficult conditions you work under? Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, we uh, work a lot on environmental human rights defenders. In fact, we lead an international coalition on, on trying to uh, promote and protect uh, environmental human rights, uh, promote the work of and protect the rights of environmental human rights defenders. Um, and I agree with Ahmed, I think the, the clear uh, trend over the past 10 years has been a shrinking of civil society space, not everywhere, but in many countries, um, because civil society advocates or human rights defenders 
uh, risk upsetting the narrative which is pushed by the governments in those countries that you know everything is wonderful uh, and when and human rights defenders say well no it isn't then the governments uh, rather than listening they clamp down on them um, so it is I think getting worse you see that in terms of number of attacks but I would uh, put a bit of a caveat to that and that is I also think our ability to monitor uh, attacks and killings has also improved uh, so you know it's difficult to know the degree to which this is just a problem that's getting worse and worse or it's a, a case of we are getting better at gathering the data so we know uh, that people are being um, attacked and a good example of that is the work of Global Witness, which is an NGO that focuses on environmental human rights defenders. And the second part of that caveat is we, in a way, we've kind of expanded what we consider as human rights defenders. Uh, when we started working on environmental defenders 10 years ago, many organizations didn't want to call them environmental human rights defenders. Uh, they want to say that, well, these are environmental activists, and by calling them human rights defenders, we risk kind of diluting the definition of human rights defenders. Um, that argument has been won, but it, it does show that, you know, it, it feeds in. But I think undoubtedly overall, um, the situation is incredibly worrisome, which raises the issue that you mentioned of reprisals. Um, and clearly that's part of that because human rights defenders who come to Geneva, they break this narrative that pushed by the governments that, you know, we're great on human rights. And we saw that most tragically, of course, when a human rights defender from China tried to come to the Universal Periodic Review to tell the world that China was not as good as it says it was. And they arrested that person at the airport and that person then died in, in detention in China. Um, since then, the Human Rights Council has got much better and stronger at actually addressing reprisals. The president of the council now has considerable powers to call out uh, reprisals, um, but the countries that are committing these reprisals have also upped their game. Also now there's a, a Secretary General's report once a year on reprisals. They've also upped their game and so they, they try to do it now much more uh, quietly, for example through you know, blocking visas so people can't travel and things like that. Um, so there is this massively important game in a sense going on uh improving protections but then the human rights violators are changing their tactics um but it's you know we're, we're in a better place i think than we were 10 years ago when all of these things were happening you know underneath the radar so we just didn't know about them thank you for for highlighting those initiatives to try to address the reprisals but um yeah of course the, st the states that don't want people to speak will find ways to prevent them from doing so that's very sadly as you as you say and highlights the real risk that human rights defenders face um thank you for answering that round of questions i think we're going to go to some audience questions now in the time that we have left so i'll just uh field them both to you we've got two so far but i welcome others from the audience and, uh, and give uh, Ahmed and Marka a chance to respond. Um, the first question is related to the situation of the, of the Uyghur Muslim minorities in, in China, uh, and of course the, the, the severe persecution that they face, the many human rights violations uh, that have been perpetrated by the government of China, and it's certainly um, broadly known what's happening there. Perhaps you could, uh, one of you or both, comment on how are civil society organizations using those international human rights spaces to bring attention to this? What kind of coordination do you see? What kind of strategies? So that would be the first question. The second one we have concerns um, Nordic Baltic cooperation and activism in Geneva. And the question is, is it more visible than it used to be, uh, especially what issues would you see relevant uh, contributions of these states? So Nord Nordic and Baltic uh, states, how are they contributing to human rights uh, discussions within Geneva? Um, so let's start with those two and then I'll go back to some other questions from the audience after that. So Amma, do you want to, to start with either commenting on the Uyghur situation or how you see the Nordic and Baltic states cooperating? Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I think first I, I 
need to also let you know that we don't, uh, China is not one of the uh, priority countries, or we don't have members in China, so we, it's not one of the main priority countries in our advocacy. Uh, it is, uh, I mean, it, it is a deficiency in, deficiency in our advocacy, but uh, because we, we, we work based on the work of our members, we haven't been able to find an independent NGO based inside China because of the, the situation, so we don't really work directly on China, but um, I, but just looking at what the, the developments at the council, um, I think there is a lot of uh, focus on the situation in China now, especially with regards to the situation in Uyghurs and, and also the situation in Hong Kong, um, especially with the, with the recent legislative changes and, and uh, pushback on, on the democracy movement. Um, I think there's, Although there's still not much, um, uh, all, all the action of the council has not been as much, uh, well, it has not really met the expectations of many civil society organizations uh, that work on, on the issue more, more prominently on the, on the issue of China. Um, there's been significantly increasing focus on the situation there, which I think has also created, or which has also made China pushed back more strongly on different institutions. For example, the I think the pushback on special procedure mechanisms, for example, is somewhat related to the increased scrutiny of uh, the the situ of the situation uh, by different mandate holders in in China, especially Uyghur Muslims. So I think um, and and I think at the same time, they a lot of um, developing a lot of states from the global south have start to speak in defense of China. Um, um, I think during the last session of the council, we saw a number of statements by African states and, and Asian states in defense of China and then the criticism of China by uh, they call Western governments or, or, or the special procedure mandates. Um, I, I mean, again, I probably also has something to do with the, the economic relations that many of these countries have with China. Um, and um, also their own issues, uh, their own internal issues, uh, which many of these countries that are uh, defending China are also um, targets of scrutiny of the, of the council and different uh, council mechanisms and also targets of criticism from other uh, NGOs and then uh, Western governments. So it, it's more of a, we, we see it as a tit for tack, uh, kind of a um, play there. So, but I, I think there is uh, increasing uh, cooperation between different NGOs, especially uh, those who are more active on, um, on China to, to get uh, council and the UN mechanisms to act on China. On, I am not sure if I can speak so much on the on the Nordic and Baltic um, cooperation, but um, we have seen uh, countries like North Macedonia or Montenegro uh, being a little bit more active on, say, like I mentioned earlier, they've been uh, in the, in the, uh, part of the core group on on Sri Lanka, um, for example. But I am not sure if I can speak so much about the the, the cooperation there. Yeah. Thank you, Ahmed, for those insights. And Mark, you want to come back on these two questions? Yeah, sure. On the Uyghur uh, situation, Xinjiang, um, it's really interesting because you've got a microcosm there of the changing um, political dynamics in the Human Rights Council, which for all you academics out there is a massively under-researched area. There's lots of textbooks about the theory of uh, how institutions like the Human Rights Council are uh, supposed to work, but very little on the what's the really important thing, which is the politics at play, coalition, shifting alliances. Um, and uh, the Uyghur situation is a great result of that. I mean, let's be honest, it's uh, it has all of the elements of, of genocide. Um, in, in uh, Xinjiang province, uh, awful scenes, awful stories coming out. Um, and the Human Rights Council, apart from a few joint statements, has been almost silent on uh, 
uh, the situation, certainly no talk of even a resolution. Um, that's for a number of reasons. Firstly, uh, the only country that can really uh, take the fight to China within the United Nations is the United States. And they were off the council for, for three or four years under uh, Trump. Um, China, and, but equally importantly, China has become very effective now. They have a much bigger delegation than they used to be. Uh, and they're much better at using, for example, the alliances they forged through the Belt and Road Initiative uh, to get a very large group of, of uh, states that, who are on their side. Um, people maybe don't realize because there has been little research in the politics of the Human Rights Council, that the default setting really is the West against the rest. Uh, on most issues, uh, you start from an understanding that the West will be on one side and everybody else on the other, with the floating regional group being really the, the Latin Americans, the Grulags, who have shifted, as I mentioned earlier, more away from the developing country uh, stock position towards uh, supporting the West on many issues. Uh, but still, even with the Latin Americans, the, the West just doesn't have the numbers unless it has a significant number of Asians and Africans. Um, and, uh, you know, Ahmed mentioned the, the competing joint statements earlier this year and late last year. Um, and the fact is that China, when they um, lobbied to have, I think, Belarus de de delivered one on their behalf and Cuba delivered another. And they got more signatures than the West, uh, the Western joint statement that were West-led joint statement that was critical of China. Um, and China, you know, the, the press court, the, the press spokesman was cock a hoop over that. Uh, you know, it was a propaganda victory for them that they got more uh, signatures and for me the most egregious uh, example of this um, you know policy and decision making at the Human Rights Council being driven by geopolitics and money rather than by human rights concerns is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. In, in other areas I've praised them already for example I think they've been on the right side of history when it comes to a more robust approach to, to hate speech and the West was probably on the wrong side of history. Um, but on this, it, it's uh, appalling. Uh, you know, these are Muslims who are being killed and uh, sterilized and forced into uh, labor, uh, labor camps. Uh, and yet the vast majority of the Organization of Islamic Conference have backed China every step of the way. Um, <laughs> I mean, you just beg, when I say this to people, it beggars, they're, they're shocked and uh, rightly so, and often just can't believe it. But it really does show that for the Pakistans of the world, the Saudi Arabias of the world, I mean, Saudi Arabia is supposed to be, you know, the, the, the leading uh, Muslim country uh, in, in the world, and yet they back China every step of the way. Um, and, you know, as long as that remains the case, as long as countries, especially Pakistan, I mean, I'm a fan of Pakistan in Geneva. I think they often play a very positive role on many issues, uh, but money talks. And, you know, China is essential to Pakistan now in terms of investments and building infrastructure and, and uh, filling their budgetary shortfalls. And so these uh, countries will just do whatever China tells them to do. Um, and that means that we're not, we're simply not going to have a resolution on, on uh, Xinjiang and what's going on there or on Hong Kong, um, notwithstanding how shocked we all are about what's happening there. Uh, it's no coincidence, of course, that a big priority for the United States, which is now coming back into the Human Rights Council, is to turn the heat up on China. Um, both thematically, for example, there'll be a new initiative which we're wor working with the United States on for the upcoming session on democracy. And the idea there is to counteract this growing Chinese narrative that they, their controlled democracy uh, is the best, basically, and other countries in Africa and Asia should copy their model for democracy. 
and so the US is is now going to start pushing back against that uh, by reminding people what democracy is and what it isn't. Uh, but also in terms of country specific, um, you will see, one, especially once the US becomes a member from January onwards, that they will be much more robust, I think, in trying to build coalitions against China. Oh, sorry, and on Nordics, uh, you know, not much to say apart from generally they're fantastic uh, at uh, the Human Rights Council. They're really very progressive. They punch way above their weight. Um, you know, of course, they have problems. And in Denmark, for example, it's been mentioned uh, uh, within government, there's been a rightward shift on mi migra migration issues, for example. Um, uh, Norway, when we talk about human rights and environments, often has hang-ups about that because of their big oil industry. Uh, but generally speaking, they're incredibly uh, positive influence. And what's good about the Nordics is they often are well viewed by developing countries, more so than the US and the EU. Uh, they're seen as countries who uh, developing countries can talk to and be in core groups with and work with. Um, and so they really, I often say to my friends from Norway and Denmark and uh, uh, and Iceland and places like that, that if they were to ever leave like Trump did, everybody thought once the US left, the Human Rights Council would collapse. It didn't. It actually did better uh, without Trump there. But undoubtedly, if the Nordics left, uh, then the Human Rights Council, I think, would collapse. Also financially. <laughs> Thank, thank goodness for the Nordics. Right, I think we're gonna to have to draw to a close. Uh, thank you to those other questions we've had posted. I'm afraid we won't be able to get to them today um, because we run out of time, but thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you to, to Mark and Ackman for a fascinating review of what's happening at the UN on human rights. Um, you know, as a researcher, you've offered me personally and hopefully the audience some fascinating insights into the day-to-day -day diplomacy at the UN and how we see that shaping up. So uh, I hope that's useful for, for our audience members also to get those reflections from practitioners on the ground who are, yeah, who are dealing with the challenging environment of human rights diplomacy as it is uh, at the UN. So thank you so much for your time and contributions. It's greatly appreciated. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. <laughs>